Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming to what might be one of our last uh, recorded sessions of the year. We are talking about um, Tesla Durbervilles chapters 50 through 52, and all I got to say is, oh my goodness, what an ending to that phase. Um, the walls are literally closing in on Tess. There's a lot to talk about here, so I just want to jump right in there and get started. Okay, so we start with um, with some great uh, description of the, the land and the area that she is going through. This is classic Thomas Hardy. She plunged into the chilly equinoctial, equinoctial, I don't even know how that's pronounced, uh, darkness as the clock struck 10 for her 15 miles walk under the steely stars. What a great way to start the, um, uh, a, a downward spiral for our hero, plunging into chilly dark, darkness, steely stars. Um, just to remind everybody where she's going right now, when last we saw Tess, she, um, she was told by her sister Liza Lou that her mother was dying and had to come home, and she had to come home in order to, um, in order to help out. Uh, continuing on with the description of the land, the abyss of chaotic shade, which was all that revealed itself of the veil on whose further side she was born. This is her standing at the top of a hill and looking at, um, at a land that early on in the text was described as um, sheltered, uh, as green, as lush, as fertile, and now it's being described as an abyss of chaotic shade. Um, more descriptions of the land, but I do want to get to this part here where it starts talking about her home. And the reason why is because this is so ironic. As we know, that by the time we get to chapter 52, um, she is kicked out of this home. And we'll get to that um, in a little bit. But this is how it is described as she um, first enters the village for what will be the last time. As soon as she could discern the outline of the house newly thatched with her money, uh, it had all its old effect on Tessa's imagination, part of her body and life it ever seemed to be. The slope of its dormers, the finish of its gables, the broken courses of brick which topped the chimney all had something in common with their personal character. A stupefaction had come into these features. To her regard, it meant the illness of her mother. And, um, and so we have her talking about the close connection that she has with the house, um, the house of her her entire life, her, her youth, her childhood, and the place where her family has lived. And, um, and, and if you know Thomas Hardy, you know at this point that there's probably something bad that's going to happen, and so enough it is. Um, what happens is that her mother gets better, but her father dies. And while we're on that subject, let's, um, let's just continue talking about that. Um, her father's life had a value apart from his personal achievements, or perhaps it would not have had much. It was the last of three lives for whose duration the house and premises were held under a lease, and it had long been coveted by the tenant farmer for his regular laborers who were stinted in cottage accommodations. Moreover, liviers were dis disapproved of in villages almost as much as little freeholders because of their independence manner. And when a lease determined, uh, it was never renewed. And what that's saying there is that, um, is that now that uh, John has died, um, the person who owns the house and who owns the land can kick them out. And, uh, and, and this is not in any connection whatsoever to the, the, the mother or the woman or the wife. Um, this is all dependent on the fate of the man, the husband. And so once the husband dies, um, the, the wife and the kids are thrown out and there's nothing that it can be done for them. Uh, it's in just another indication of how this um, misogynistic society uh, negatively impacts um, Tess and her family. The other thing is that um, is that there's a little tongue-in-cheek comment here about the independence of people like John Derbyfield, who have lived on a plot of land that isn't theirs for so long, and uh, and so society also frowns on people having 
that kind of, of independence. Um, there's this comment at the very end. Thus the Derby Fields, once Durbervilles saw descending upon them the destiny, which no doubt when they were among the Olympians of the county, they had caused to descend many a time and severely enough upon the heads of such landless ones as they themselves were now. So do flux and reflux, the rhythm of change, alternate and persist in everything under the sky. And we've seen this comment before uh, a couple of times in the text where the narrator is musing on the fact that when they were in power, they probably did the same thing to the people who were under their thrall, the uh, Durbervilles. And um, and I think it's a it's a it's an important thing to keep in mind the idea that um, that while you're in power, uh, you shouldn't plan on it lasting forever. And so you, what you might want to do is you might want to think about okay, so how is it you should um, that you should uh, perform? How should you uh, maintain yourself um, knowing that you are going to, at some point um, in history, in the long scheme of things, that you might also be needing help. Um, so when someone comes to you asking for help, it should give you some pause. Um, speaking of needing help, Tess and her family need help right now. And help comes from a, um, an unwelcome place for Tess, but the way it's described is genius. So we've seen Alec Durbeville described in terms um, having to do with uh, with fire and with flame. Um, uh, he is described early on as being wreathed in smoke a lot. Um, but here, this description here is something uh, a little bit more. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what. Um, about what happens here. Uh, so Tess is out in the field and she's caring for the field because her father's not well. And it's talking about uh, about how she is turning the earth with a fork. Um, and the earth is on fire as they are trying to burn out weeds um, to clear land. So it was on one of these couch burning plots that she labored with her fork. It's four shining prongs resounding against the stones and dry clods in little clicks. Sometimes she was completely involved in the smoke and of her fire, and then it would leave her figure free, irradiated by the brassy glare from the heat. The effect of the whole being was that of a wedding and funeral guest in one. And uh, if that doesn't sum up Tess's situation, I don't know what does. She is, um, she is living uh, continually a life that is part wedding and part funeral at the very same time. Uh, let's keep keep going on here. Um, she suddenly seems uh, she suddenly sees a man in a long smock frock, who she found was forking the same plot as herself, and whom she supposed her father had sent there to advance the work. She became more conscious of him when the direction of his digging brought him closer. Sometimes the smoke divided them, and then it swerved, and then the two were visible to each other, but divided from all the rest. By and by, he dug so close to her that the fire beams were reflected as distinctly from the steel prongs of his fork as from her own. On going up to the fire to throw a pitch of dead weeds upon it, she found that he did the same on the other side. The fire flared up, and she beheld the face of Durville. So uh, imagine for just a moment, he is dressed all in black, um, uh, an overcoat um, that goes from neck to ankle. Um, He's got a pitchfork in his hand, and when she sees him for the first time, in this particular case, he is revealed to her by a fiery flame. Uh, this is definitely trying to um, conjure up images of the devil. The unexpectedness of his presence, the grotesqueness of his appearance in a gathered smock frock such as it was now worn only by the most old-fashioned of the laborers had a ghastly comicality that chilled her as to its bearing. Durbeville emitted a low, long laugh. How devilish. And then he continues on. If I were inclined to joke, I should say how much this seems like paradise, he remarked whimsically, looking at her with an inclined head. What did you say? She asks, 
A jester might say, this is just like paradise. You are Eve, and I am the old other one come to tempt you in the disguise of an inferior animal. And that is clearly a reference to the devil and uh, the first temptation, the fall of man, if you will. And so Alec himself is now describing himself as the devil there to tempt Eve to bring about her destruction. Um, and, uh, and so he, he says to her, that um that he's going to help her she says no 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 no. they have to move um and there is some talk about uh about the moving in the very next chapter chapter 51. um the moving is not all that unusual if you have been tracing the uh marxist critique then you might also have picked up this part here depopulation was going on the village had formerly contained side by side with the agricultural laborers an interesting and better informed class ranking distinctly above the former the class to which tess's father and mother had belonged and including the carpenter the smith the shoemaker the huckster together with the nondescript workers other than farm laborers a set of people who owed a certain stability of aim and conduct to the fact of their being life holders like like Tess's father or copy holders or occasionally small freeholders and they are all having to leave the um the the village cottagers who were not directly employed on the land were looked upon with disfavor and the banishment of some starved the trade of others who were thus obliged to follow these families who had formed the backbone of the village life in the past who were the depositaries of the village traditions had to seek refuge in large centers the process humorously designated by statisticians as the tendency of the rural population towards the large towns being really the tendency of water to flow uphill and forced by machinery and there is some uh, real good tongue-in-cheek uh, description here basically of gentrification of uh, the rest of the neighborhood is becoming nicer as nicer people move in and so the uh, original inhabitants have to leave because they can't keep up and what this does is this creates a situation where the people who used to service the persons who lived there they also have to leave um, because uh, because they no longer have a place there um, uh, to, to service the original uh, villagers there um, and so on top of everything else you've got a critique of gentrification here in Tesla d'Urbervilles as well um, you've really got a little bit of everything in here um, <coughs> Pardon me. Let's uh, keep on going. Um, Alec comes by uh, while she is sitting there inside. It's raining outside. Um, and, uh, and he once again says to her, you should come live back in Trantridge. You can live in the cottage where you originally were. Uh, I'll tell your mother. She will, she will jump at the occasion. And Tess says, no, 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 no. But we learn one other important thing here. We learned about the Durbaville coach, and uh, this is a story that was alluded to by Angel a couple of times, and Alec is going to tell us what it's all about. Uh, I, if you are a genuine Durbaville, I ought not to tell you either, I suppose. Matter. It's a rather dismal, it is rather dismal. It is that the sound of a non-existent coach can only be heard by one of Durbaville blood, and it is held to be of ill omen to the one who hears it. It has to do with a murder committed by one of the family centuries ago. One of the family is said to have abducted some beautiful woman who tried to escape from the coach in which he was carrying her off, and in the struggle he killed her or she killed him. I forget which. And the text doesn't really clarify um, uh, which, which person kills the other person, um, but certainly uh, a, 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 an astute reader can see the parallels between um, Tess and, and uh, Alex's situation and it's the description of the situation uh, as it is here. Um, and it seems to imply that one or the other, as the woman is trying to escape, uh, is going to potentially die. And so, uh, so it'll be curious to see which one it is. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, ah, here we have it. Um, after, after this meeting with Alec, she sends him off. She refuses him again. But she is placed in a situation where she doesn't have a whole lot of options. Um, now that she, that now there is no man, now that there is no he head of the house, um, her entire family, including her brothers and sisters, who she cares for very, very much, they're all vulnerable. And so she has to make a decision um, 
about all of them, herself and um, and her family. And so she's being placed in a situation where she is tempted to uh, go under the care and keeping of her assault, of her assailant. Um, the person who assaulted her will have control over her. Uh, and in fact, I, in the in the next uh, chapter, or maybe it's at the end of this one, no, in the next one, oh no, or is it back? Uh, let's see. No, it must be in 52. He says, remember, I was your master once and I will be your master again. Um, and so this is the situation that she finds herself in. She is totally and completely desperate. And so what she does is she writes to Angel. Um, let's see, where is that? Uh, um, she writes to Angel and it is, um, here it is. And it is um, the most forceful thing she's written so far. Why have you treated me so monstrously? I do not deserve it. I have thought it all over carefully. I can never, never forgive you. You know that I did not intend to wrong you. Why have you so wronged me? You are cruel. Cruel indeed. I will try to forget you. It is all injustice that I have received at your hands. And and she finally stands up for herself. She finally calls Angel out. And, um, and, uh, and she sends the letter off. She actually sends it. Um, uh, and so good for her. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how much good it's going to do her at this point, but at least she's able to get it out. Um, and so now we're off to 52 heartbreaking, heartbreaking scene. Um, they load up the entire wagon. Uh, they, um, they go to Kingsbeer, uh, which the mother Joan has chosen simply because of the connection of the family to, um, to Kingsbeer. Because uh, that's where the D'Urbervilles are buried. And when they get there, they find out that um, there's no room for them in town. The rooms that they thought they were going to had never been confirmed. Um, whether it was due to a mixed-up letter or due to a mixed-up Joan, it's unclear. Um, but, uh, but one thing that is clear is that they do not have a place to go to. And... Um, and, and so uh, they have to unload the wagon, and they unload the wagon in the churchyard. And there's this really interesting comment here um, where it says that uh, it looked like, it looked like a, a house or a home, but without, without a roof to uh, protect them. And Joan says this one thing. It's, it's just, once again, so ironic. Isn't your family vault your own freehold, said Tess's mother? As she returned from a reconnoiter of the church and graveyard? Why, of course it is. And that's where we'll camp. Girls, till the place of your ancestors finds us a roof. Now, Tess and Liza and Abraham, you help me. We'll make a nest for these children and we'll have another look around. And so, um, and so having nothing else to look forward to, having no other options, the family claims the graveyard, the vault that holds the bones of the dead as their freehold, as their property, as their land. Um, and it's just a, a stunning, stunning, uh, pathetic uh, moment in the novel. But it, wait, it gets worse. Um, when, uh, when, when Tess goes down into the vault, in order to explore it. She is thinking, she's musing. Um, she has a really heightened sense of, of the um, irony of everything that's happening here and the, um, and the pathos of everything that's happening here. She goes down and in the dust, she had not noticed it before and would hardly have noticed it now before an odd fancy that the effigy moved. And the effigy in this case would be the statue that's lying prone on the top of a um, of a sepulcher, where um, where the bones are inside, and the effigy is supposed to be uh, um, like a statue representing that person in their life. And all of a sudden, she thinks of that move. So so imagine this: she is distraught, she is overwhelmed, she is in 
by herself in a, in a graveyard. If you guys remember Romeo and Juliet from last year, uh, Juliet is thinking to herself about, um, about what it means to take the potion that's going to make it look like she's dead, be buried with her ancestors. And she thinks for a moment, what would happen if I awoke by myself? Would I go crazy? Would I start to take the bones of my ancestors and bash my own brains in? And that's the case that Tess finds herself in right now. She is down there all alone with her dead ancestors' bones. And all of a sudden, there is an effigy on one of the vaults that starts to move. Um, uh, let's see. And as she drew close, she discovered all in a moment that the figure was a living person. And to her shock, uh, and, to, and, and the shock to her sense of not having been alone was so violent that she was quite overcome and sank down night of fainting. Not, however, until she recognized Alec Durbeville in the form. So he's lying there on it, and he is playing a practical joke on her. Um, it's it's uh, it's it's once again Hardy's um, uh, uh, ironic sense of humor um, that you have Alec, who has been depicted as the devil um, all throughout the text. Now he is uh, inhabiting graveyards and popping up um, out of graves. Uh, as if to be a specter himself. Um, he says, the little finger of a sham Durbeville can do more for you than the whole dynasty of the real underneath. Now command me, what shall I do? And she says, go away. And he says, nope. He says, you'll be civil yet. And he, and with that, he leaves to go find the mother. He's going to tell the mother of his plan that they all come and live with um, with him on his estate uh, in Trantridge. And Tess says, why am I on the wrong side of this door? And the door is separating the living and the dead. And she feels right now this moment where she would rather be dead. And, you know, we've, we've kind of seen her talk about it would be better if she was never born before. Um, but this is the first time that I can remember that she has, um, that she has, uh, asked, uh, the powers that be, um, why it is that she is continuing to live and hasn't yet died already. Um, Marion it is who Tess met on the way to Kingsbeer. Uh, during moving day, um, they uh, they think about her plight, and in a moment of sisterhood unity, they also write to Angel, and they say, "Tess is in serious trouble, and you need to come and help her." And uh, and, and it's a real moment where they stand up for her. They stand up to an upper class gentleman, um, and when their where their loyalty to their sister to a fellow uh, woman wins out over their fear and deference to, um, to a member of the upper class. Um, and it's a great, great moment. Uh, and, uh, end of phase the sixth, um, and uh, in the next phase is called phase the seventh fulfillment. And so, uh, so I guess we'll find out what uh, gets fulfilled. Um, what are the expectations that are fulfilled? Um, what are the lives that become fulfilled, uh, the promises that become fulfilled. Uh, and so what we have to do is we have to keep on reading. Um, so you're going to want to read the rest, whether you um, whether you come to Tuesday and we finish up talking or you come on Wednesday and we finish up talking. Uh, it is entirely up to you. Um, but, uh, but I encourage you to finish the text. The way the text ends is extremely fulfilling. Um, uh, as long as, uh, as long as you have a particular understanding of it. Um, and so when you first read it, you might find that you did not find that very fulfilling at all, and you might be disappointed in it. But, um, but, uh, but there's, a, there's a particular way of looking at the situation that hopefully will leave you um, satisfied. And so that's what we'll do. We'll talk about that ending. So, uh, so I encourage you to read the rest of it, and I encourage you to come to uh, to our last couple of, of um, live sessions. Uh, I'll let you know what's happening on Tuesday. I think we're going to have to go 
a little earlier on Tuesday. We might do 10 and 12 instead of 12 and 2 because I have to be in school at 1 o'clock on Tuesday. So, uh, so yep. So I hope to see you all on Tuesday, and I'll set a message um, saying what it is that uh, that's going to be happening.